Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome to the Guilty as Charged podcast presented by the Chargers Podcast Network. My name is Steven, and I'm the host, as always, coming to you on a Monday evening. You guys will be listening to this uh, early in the week than usual on Tuesday. And uh, happy to dive into free agency today with my guy, Tyler. Tyler, what's up, man? How are you doing today? Steven, I am ready to podcast with enthusiasm unknown to mankind. Let's do this. Nice. Love to see it. We got it. We got to get the acronyms down to uh, EUTB. No, EUTM. Excuse me. EUTM. We'll get it. We'll get it. Uh, yeah, that was a great video that the Chargers did. Um, the Ravens also added an interview of uh, Jack Harbaugh as well on their channel. So uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, but we'll, uh, we're going to dive into the start of free agency today. Also talk about some uh, future needs, draft implications, maybe if we have time uh, about anything that's going on today. Um, before we dive in, as always, Tyler and I are fans of the team, just like you guys are. The opinions that we express on the show are not always reflective of the opinions of the Chargers organization. Um, instead, it is just that. It is our opinions, and we're very grateful to have this platform and be able to dive into things like this. So, uh, like I said, we're recording this on Monday evening. The first day of the legal tampering period is is about to come to an end. It's 5 p.m. as of recording this. Um, the start of the new league year is on Wednesday. You guys will be listening to this on Tuesday. So uh, apologies if it's not completely up to date of what we are going to talk about today. But um, Tyler, I think it's it's only fair that we discuss the latest news around Mr. Austin Eckler. Um, as it currently stands, he is slated to uh, sign with the Washington Commanders. It is a reunion uh, of sorts with Anthony Lynn. And we'll get to some of the Chargers-specific news here in a minute in terms of additions and things like that. But um, I felt it's only right to start with Austin Eckler because he's given so much to the franchise. And I know it didn't end well. I know he battled through some injuries and things like that. But um, one of the best and coolest stories of Chargers football over the last 20 years that I can remember going from an undrafted free agent who uh, was not even projected to be like a practice squad player to becoming a true core piece of the franchise over the last eight years. So uh, I wanted to give a shout out to Austin Eckler for everything he's done for the Chargers, everything that he's battled through to overcome these, uh, you know, the circumstances that were given him, um, played through some injuries, everything like that and was one of the most productive players in the NFL over the last seven, eight years. So um, I'm going to miss watching him play. I'm going to have to get a new jersey because he is one of my jerseys, but um, wish him nothing but the best in Washington. And I think it's pretty cool that he is, you know, reuniting with uh, former head coach Anthony Lynn. Yeah, anything but the AFC, definitely not the AFC West. So congratulations to Austin Eckler. Hope you have a great rest of your career, whether it's in Washington or if he goes somewhere else after that. Phenomenal player to watch over several years since he joined the league in 2017 undrafted free agent every year a chargers undrafted free agent makes it but there's a difference between making it and then being one of the best at your position for several years and that was austin eckler and the moment he stepped onto that field not wearing number 30 i believe it was number three he mm -hmm. went out there and and crushed it and we fell in love with his game receiving rushing special teams you name it and from and from there on he just captivated chargers fans and stole their hearts so he was awesome to watch um, wish him nothing but the best yeah, 100 percent. So we'll we'll see how that goes. Monitor that situation. Um, like I mentioned, we'll dive into some of the Chargers specific uh, reactions here. And and secondly, I think on this list, we do have to discuss the re future return. All of these moves are not official yet. They are still technically unofficial. They have not been announced and, and confirmed by the team yet. But um, Mr. Alohi Gilman is returning to the Chargers, uh, according to the NFL Network insiders on a two year 11 million dollar contract what are your thoughts here as we you know we we kind of talked about solving free agency solving safety and free agency excuse me um and the Chargers take a big step forward there by bringing alohi gilman back yeah problem solved uh congratulations to him there may not have been a more deserving player i mean this guy has fought from being the 186th overall pick in that draft to now getting this contract and supposedly being with the team for the next couple of years he was my breakout candidate. He's the player I thought would break out. And he was doing some good things in the spring, um, some great things in camp. And he just stole the show the entire rest of the way. I think he got a game ball from us maybe three times this mm -hmm. past season. I think he had more game balls from us than anybody else. And he totally broke out. He was 10th or top 10 in forced incompletion rate, forced fumbles, passes broken up, wins above replacement, and overall grade in 2023. And I think he's just perfect 
for what the Chargers need moving forward and moving forward on defense with Derwin James. And here's a quote from Derwin James last year, last spring. He said, I have a lot of confidence in him as my safety partner. He's a guy that's consistent. Everyone here counts on him. Everyone knows he's going to be where he needs to be. And at this point, I think you and I have watched somewhere between 20 to 30 hours of Michigan defense, the same <laughs> three, four, five games over and over and over again. And it's so apparent with Jesse Minter and this defense and in this scheme, you have to be the scheme. You play to the scheme. It's not an individual defense where you know you try to make your plays and leave everybody else hanging out to dry. It's about each other and about playing for one another. And it's so important that you know I've watched, I think, eight defensive guys that are draftable from Michigan on defense. And every single one of them, from the best projected player to the guy who might be an undrafted free agent, they all play for each other. And they're very scheme sound. They're very smart. They rarely make mistakes. They tackle. And that's Alohi Gilman. So I think he's just a perfect player for the Chargers in general, but also for this defense. I think it's fantastic that he's going to return to the Chargers. Yeah, I think it's great as well. Obviously, the, the Chargers hired his former safeties coach from Notre Dame, too. So that, it kind of helps build that continuity, even though he'll be looting, learning a, a new scheme. I think this is great news, and I think it's a contract that is well-deserved in this kind of safety market that's become a little stagnant overall in the NFL. But you look at what Alohi has been able to bring to the Chargers, and it's just that spark plug mentality. You know, I felt like any time the Chargers needed a turnover, needed a big hit on somebody, needed a, you know, a big pass breakup, um, it was it, it almost always felt like it was Alohi Gilman in terms of the coverage players, you know, working alongside Derwin James. So he just has that that innate ability to always be around the football. And it, it's it's a trait that that translates and, and it doesn't necessarily automatically equate to like being you know the most athletic or the biggest player or, um, you know, the, the first round pick like Alohi just has that ability to find the football and make plays. And I think. One more reason why I'm excited here is specifically because I think we will see him play a little bit more of his natural position, which is more of like the strong safety position this year. Um, he had to do a lot of free safety looks this this past couple of seasons because of, you know, putting Derwin James around the box and things like that. But I, I think we've we've kind of learned that there might be some more slot packages in store for Derwin James which would allow Alohi Gilman to play more around the box, play more, you know, closer to the football and use his instincts, use his ability to make plays on the ball and get him more active. And I think that's a huge thing for him as well. So, you know, I know that this is a guy who was a six round draft pick, but he's continued to get better and better and better every single year of his career. And I think that can still happen. I think that's, you know, this is a guy who can still continue to improve, um, be a leader in the back end of the defense, be a, a, a trend setter, a, a tone setter, if you will. And I, I'm excited to see how this pans out because I think this is a great fit for the scheme. I think it's a great contract, a, a deserved contract. You know, he posted a, a video on Instagram himself, <laughs> you know, of him longboarding around his his condo apartment complex, whatever the case is. Uh, so he's very excited as a, you know for himself. And I think this is overall was a great way to start free agency. I'm excited to have Aloe Gillen back in powder blue. Yeah, just go look at the last couple of years. Joe Hortiz talked about he's looking for players. I think he mentioned more specifically the draft, but guys that are always locked in, whether they're up 30 or down 30 in the fourth quarter, yeah. you name it, like those guys that are always locked in. And that was Alohi Gilman. You know, you watch the first few games, watch the Minnesota game. You know, he's covering um, the tight end, uh, Hawkinson. Hawkinson, yeah. And, you know, breaks up a pass and he shuts down a, a run at the goal line you know, the previous drive, which prevents the Vikings from scoring. He gets a fourth down stop against the Packers. He creates interceptions against the Bears. Like, this guy is just a playmaker, and I'm so excited that they're keeping him around. You know, last year, I think Khalil Mack, I think inarguably was the best defensive player overall. But Gillen was the spark. Gillen was the spark that generated one turnover, two turnovers, or forced a turnover on downs that gave the offense a chance again. Yeah, 100% agree there. It, it was a true pleasure watching him play last year, take that next step. And uh, I think we'll see another big step this year working with Jesse Minter's defense, reuniting with his old position coach, continue to build with Derwin James. Like that's that's the thing. A lot a lot of like safety play is so, it, it's so mental, right? Like it, it's a position where you really have to rely on instincts and, and uh, you know, high IQ uh, tendencies. And a lot of that is just kind of being in the same place, working with the same people. And this is, you know, last year was his first year heading into the season where he was projected to be the starter. 
this year will be year two, uh, another year with working with Derwin James and, you know, getting back to some familiar roots, I think is going to be huge for him. So I'm really excited about this. Again, the Chargers have not made it official as of uh, recording this. Would expect that to happen at some point soon, but um, great deal for, for Alohi. Great deal for the Chargers. Really excited they, that they got this done. Uh, the next deal that I think we uh, should touch on is the addition of Gus Edwards. The running back market uh, got off to a little bit of a hot start today with DeAndre Swift going to the Bears on a, on a pretty big deal. And I think um, that kind of set the tone for they but Josh Jacobs to the Packers. You had uh, Saquon Barkley to the Eagles. Uh, we just talked about Austin Eckler. So a lot of moving parts. Tony Pollard to the Titans. Um, so the Chargers end up uh, not settling for, but but finding a reunion of sorts with Gus Edwards. The deal is, uh, according to Tom Pelissero, a two-year, $6.5 million contract. This is a guy that is obviously familiar with uh, Greg Roman, as well as Joe Ortiz, the guy who drafted him. So I think this is a great value. We we kind of talked about this being like the area of running back that uh, the Chargers should be kind of shopping for, if you will. So, Tyler, what are your thoughts about how Gus Edwards fits in the Chargers offense going forward? Oh, Perfectly. It's a perfect fit, obviously, because of the connection specifically with the Ravens and with Greg Roman. With Greg Roman from 2019 to 2022, when Roman was the offensive coordinator, Gus Edwards was tied with Derrick Henry for fourth most rushing yards over expected per attempt over that span. So it's perfect. Reuniting him with Greg Roman is excellent. The Chargers are obviously going to want to run the ball more, and even if not more, more effectively. And Gus Edwards certainly helps with that. We had weighed different ways the Chargers could go. Could they go with one bigger name or several, you know, like mid-tier, smaller contracts like with Gus Edwards or Zach Moss, et cetera. And I think this contract is perfect. It's perfect for the Chargers. And we'll talk about some other moves, but with Gilman, with Gus Edwards, and we'll talk about Will Disley in just a bit, the Chargers have now specifically targeted positions that in the draft are very, quote unquote, weak. They're not perceived Mm -hmm. to be great positions in the draft. So the Chargers finding either familiarity or the right scheme fit or whatever in three positions of need, they needed to address these in some way. Doing that before the draft is great because now they can go into the draft and say, okay, well, instead of having to reach for XYZ position because we really need one, let's just play the strengths of the draft and go receiver, D tackle, offensive tackle, whatever it is. The Chargers, it's it's just an A plus start to free agency. Again, we'll get into the other moves and there'll be more for sure. But yeah. it's just such a great start with safety, running back, and tight end reportedly addressed early now. The Chargers are just set to just sit in the perfect spots in the draft for the best position groups. I mean, it's great stuff. Great start so far. Yeah, I completely agree to how things have started off so far. And I think Edwards, obviously, it's a very natural fit. He's played in the in the Greg Roman uh, offense for the bulk of his career to this point. Um, and, and you mentioned a bunch of the key statistics there, but also... He was fourth in short yardage goal to go success rate in the league among qualified backs. And uh, previously the Chargers running backs were 30th. Uh, <laughs> so it was, it was a, a real weakness of the team was to convert those situations. And a lot of it was, it just, it, it, like we talked about all year, it wasn't always the running back issue, right? Like there were just always seemed to be like some random issue that popped up, you know, on fourth downs. It felt like all season long, but Gus Edwards has that ability to just be that hammerhead. You know, he's a very large uh, running back. I think weighs 240 pounds. Like he is that physical downhill presence. And we kind of talked about, you know, some of the other potential running back fits, but Gus Edwards is, is the perfect fit for what Greg Roman and Jim Harbaugh want to do in terms of the, you know, early down short yardage situations. He's obviously has experience there. Um, just in terms of wins above replacement, because we've referenced that before, he was uh, 28th out of 59 qualified running backs last year. So this is this is not like a, you know, this obviously is not one of the, the top running backs in the league. But I think in terms of his specific role, he can execute it very well. He can elevate the floor of the Chargers running back room and be able to give them exactly the kind of tone setter that they want. And they want to be able to be physical, get downhill. And Gus Edwards, Gus Edwards will do that for you. Um, I don't necessarily think this deal precludes them from signing another running back if they want to go kind of get another cheap running back. Um, and we can talk about that. But I, I want your thoughts here, Tyler, about specifically maybe like how does this affect the draft at all in terms of the type of running back or maybe some targets that you you might have later on? Because we talked about like 
you know, circumstances, if you draft Derek or if you sign Derek Henry, like what does that do? If you sign Saquon Barkley, what does that do for a guy like Gus Edwards, who is going to be on a short term two year deal? He is not like that true, like RB one. Like, what are you looking for now in terms of a draft target? For year one, I'm looking for someone who is a bit more of a pass catcher or maybe has some sort of home run speed, something that's a bit more explosive. And not that Gus Edwards is, but like he's mentioned, a 240-pound back, bigger guy, short yardage, mm-hmm. contact, that sort of thing. So go find someone who's maybe stylistically a bit different. If you find someone who's similar, that's also fine too. I totally get it. That is a bit more Greg Roman style and Jim Harbaugh style. It isn't that physicality, but I think you're looking for someone at different points in the draft who fits that bill. Um, if you're thinking really late in the draft, like I really like Blake Watson out of Memphis as more of a pass catcher back. Every year there's someone out of Memphis I fall in love with, and they're always good. Uh, so Blake Watson is definitely a name to keep an eye on there if you're going that route. But I also would honestly consider the two running backs the Chargers currently have. Um, we'll see, you know, but we haven't seen much either with both of these guys. So I'm curious how how Hortiz, how Harbaugh, Roman evaluate these guys. Because to me, Isaiah Spiller is best right now as a pass catcher. And I thought that was apparent at least coming out of college. And I thought that that was something that he could really provide to this team while they had other running backs who maybe started. He was a really good pass catcher. So I think that kind of could fit. And then Elijah Dotson, I just think the, his specific type is kind of what the Chargers might be looking for if they want a stylistically different player. So while I think that they could address it in the draft, I think it's I think it's someone later on. I think it's a you know more twitchy, a bit more uh, receiving type of back. But I think that does also allow Spiller and Dotson to be a part of this offense because I think they do bring different things that Gus Edwards maybe doesn't. And if you look at the way the Ravens deployed things, they did find other guys like a Justice mm-hmm. Hill to try to be more of a, a receiver back, if you will, a, a third down back kind of guy. Yeah, I think if you if you look at the way that the Ravens have constructed the room in the past, they almost always I feel like have a guy who they trusted to kind of do everything and then a physical goal to go short yardage guy and then a speed you know pass catcher special teams player um so obviously you know what the Chargers feel like with Isaiah Spiller and Elijah Dotson remains to be seen um but they have their short yardage guy they obviously do not have a guy that they trust fully to be like a true RB1 at this point in time um maybe that becomes something probably that they address next year. But I I tend to agree. You look at the balance that the Ravens had this past season with Gus Edwards and Keaton Mitchell, specifically in like the second half of the season, like Keaton Mitchell was the perfect compliment to Gus Edwards. Um, You mentioned a couple of guys there. I know a lot of people uh, in Chargers Twitter, like Kamani Vidal as well. You know, Marshawn Lloyd has the connection to, um, you know, the, the coaching staff, obviously. Maybe Gus Edwards gives you the flexibility to, take somebody who could be more of an early down back as well. And, and maybe you get, you know, Elijah Dotson, Isaiah Spiller to kind of handle your, your pass catching duties going forward. So it is going to be really interesting. I know uh, Jordan Reed was on this channel a couple of weeks ago, talking about Braylon Allen from Wisconsin being like the perfect Jim Harbaugh guy. I, I don't know if I would want two 240 pound backs, but maybe the chargers do, maybe they do want that kind of physicality in the running back room to really set the tone going forward. Yeah, I would agree. And just looking through the list of running backs that I've watched, Like, I don't know if that means that Blake Corum is the best fit. And again, unless they want to double down at the specific type, um, although Blake Corum, smaller, um, 5'7", et cetera. But like Audric Estime from Notre Dame, I I don't think like he is the fit. If they want something different, I don't think Kendall Milton from Georgia, later round guy is quite the fit there. So I don't think Isaiah Davis is quite the fit if if they want someone different. So like you said, uh, Marshawn Lloyd, um, again, Blake Watson, who I really like, Dylan Law from New Hampshire, um, I think Benson could still work because like you said, yeah. he's a do it all back. I think that totally fits, uh, but probably too early. So I really do like the rounds like three to five, if not six and seven as well of this class. But I do like that the Chargers got Edwards to just kind of be their guy for sure. Should they miss out on a couple of guys? Cause there aren't, there aren't a ton in this class. Yeah. And you don't want to go into the draft with still needing a guy to like set your tone. Like I said, we're just going to come in and be that guy. So um, again, pretty good value here for the chargers Um, in terms of total contract value. He was, he's going to come in a million dollars less than what uh, PFF had him projected. So, um, you know, the, the, the chargers probably felt like they couldn't, you know, afford one of the expensive running backs because frankly, they were pretty expensive. So um, Gus Edwards, I'm a fan of this deal. 
Um, the next one here, obviously, this is first day, day one, but Will Disley, man, the Chargers have a blocking tight end. I am so excited about this one. Um, I've said this on our channel for years. The, the Seattle Seahawks tight end room has been my favorite room to watch because all three of their guys uh, could block, could catch, do everything. Um, so Will Disley specifically, he's going to be your inline blocking tight end. He's not going to offer you a ton of receiving upside, but um, in the run game, he's a guy that, again, is going to set the tone. This is a 6'5", 260-pound tight end. Um, and from Arjun Menon, our, our guy, he's he said that uh, Will Disley has been top 18 among all tight ends in run blocking eight grade each of the last three seasons. Um, in 2020, he was injured. But the last three seasons, he was a fantastic blocker. Last season, he was actually second in the league in run blocking grade. And this is a great fit for what the chargers have needed again similar to gus edwards you just need somebody to come in stabilize the room set the tone be able to handle all the dirty work that you need of a true tight end to in this kind of offense um will disley is going to bring all that and more um, obviously has a connection to sanjay law the wide receivers coach uh of the chargers formerly of the seattle seahawks so just checks a lot of boxes i've been asking for a blocking tight end ever since virgil green broke his ankle a few years ago uh, so this is a this is a real uh, great move from the Chargers. Good value, and since he was cut by the Seattle Seahawks, he does not count against the comp pick formula. We know how much Joe Ortiz loves those comp picks. Yeah, cycle of comp picks. Here we go, Stephen. I don't know if the Chargers are going to win a Super Bowl this year, but this is our Super Bowl. A blocking <laughs> tight end is our Super Bowl. Uh, we have been asking for one for years now because when you turn on the film. You know, you're, you're watching a game live and you see protections break down or maybe the Chargers can't run the football. And the first thought is what? It's the play callers. It's the offensive line. It's the running backs. The tight ends don't always get brought up when you're watching the broadcast view. You turn on the film the next few days and you just see, unfortunately, over the past several years and several players, they just could not hold up blocking wise. And that... The, the call was great. The offensive line protected well. I think the running back went the right way. But just the, because the tight end could not hold that block and sustain that block, the run game suffered. It was unfortunate to watch just those the, the one play or player just not quite hold up. With Disley, you, you get that. And if you're curious what the Seattle tight end blocking group looks like, go look at the 217 yards and two touchdowns they put up on the Chargers a couple <laughs> of years ago. Like, I promise they can block. And that's yeah. when I really fell in love with how Seattle blocked because rewatching that game, it wasn't just like, oh, good player. It was a really great system and they blocked well and they blocked together. And so Disley doing that for the Chargers, it, it's pretty good stuff, man. Like I, I'm really, really excited. The big question, I think more so than any name we've brought up so far, is how does this impact the draft? And yeah. in particular, one individual in Brock Bowers. I, I think... I personally believe it mostly rules out a tight end every other point in the draft, although I'm not, I'm not opposed by any means. But this specifically related to Brock Bowers, how do you feel now that Disley has, has reportedly signed of, of the Chargers' odds of taking Bowers at five? Yeah, I, I think like you mentioned, in terms of a late tight end, like I don't think you need to do like the whole like A.J. Barner thing or like Tip Ryman in terms of like the late day three blocking tight ends. If you're going to get a tight end in the draft, it's got to be somebody who can bring a, some dual upside in terms of being a blocker and a pass catcher. Um, the, the stuff with Brock Bowers, I just, I, I think at number five, he's a value because I think he's a, a generational tight end prospect. But from a financial standpoint, I get it. Like he is, he is not a financial value at number five, maybe not even in the top 10. But, you know, I, I think the Chargers would have to trade down of quite a bit in order to take Brock Bowers just based off of like the needs and the cap situation and everything like that. So I don't think it rules it out. Like, I don't think, I don't think signing Gus Edwards rules out Trey Benson in the second round or whatever the case may be. Like, I think the chargers are going to just want to draft good football players. Um, I, I've just been kind of feeling more and more that number five specifically is going to be one of the wide receivers or an offensive tackle um, just based off of like positional value and how kind of the Ravens have operated in that regard. Um, but I don't think if they trade down and they're debating between Brock Bowers, one of the corners or one of the pass rushers that 
hey, we have Will Disley. We're not taking Brock Bowers. I don't think that's going to be how they operate either. No, I, I, I agree there. And as you've pointed out before, the Ravens with Joe Hortiz, granted not as the general manager, they've gone double dipped at, at tight end four times, four separate yeah. times. Now, Bowers Disley is, is a heck of a double dip if that's kind of how you're <laughs> viewing things. Right. But I, I don't think that rules out. In fact, I think that if you're worried about anything for Brock Bowers, it's maybe as an inline blocker, as a blocking tight end. You could now take Bowers and just say, go have fun. Just go do your thing. <laughs> We're paying Will Disley a lot of money to block. You yeah. go have fun. All those SEC, SEC players that you treated like children, like just go do the same thing. Go have fun. Yeah. So I don't think it rules out Brock Bowers by any means at five. But I do think it, like you talked about with, with Barner and some of these other guys, it rules out a guy later on. But again, I'm not opposed either. Yeah, and I think the the way that Brock Bowers blocks would complement the way that uh, Will Disley blocks very well because uh, Brock Bowers does a lot of like the H back secondary blocking tight end duties that he was able to do with Darnell Washington. Not to say that uh, Will Disley is going to be Darnell Washington at Georgia because that guy was a freak at Georgia. Um, but I think it fits well. I think like a Ben Sanat from Kansas State would fit very well in that regard as well. Theo Johnson, who we've talked about, he kind of is more of like your traditional inline tight end. But I, I don't think that signing Will Disley would preclude would preclude them from drafting Theo Johnson either. Although Theo Johnson's uh, draft stock might preclude them from drafting him because he's <laughs> apparently soaring up board. So um, I, w- I would be a fan of you know taking Ben Sanat in like the fourth round if that's the move because he can do kind of some fullback stuff as well. We know that the Chargers are going to want to have a, have a fullback in route two, and and Sanat can do a lot of receiving things as well. So he's kind of more of like an Isaiah likely type, but probably mm-hmm. better blocker. So that would be a fun projection. And I think that would be a fan. The last thing I'll say about Will Disley. One thing I loved watching him when I would, ever, whenever I would watch the, the Seahawks tape is they would max protect with him essentially as like a six blocker quite often. And he's a very capable one-on-one pass protector. So he is a guy that they would trust pretty frequently, like blocking opposing edge rushers. He had a couple of good reps against Khalil Mack last season in, excuse me, in 2022, one-on-one reps where he can just, I'm going to set this edge. You guys kind of go handle your own thing. Maybe you chip with, with me as well, but he is a guy who can pass protect as well. So I, I think that will open up a lot of like the, the play action shot game where you keep Will Disley in, you six man protect. And he's a guy who can handle that kind of role too, which gives the chargers a lot of flexibility to be able to access the deep parts of the field as well. That's awesome. Love to hear that. Yep, hundred percent. So uh, those are the those are the moves that have been made today in terms of the free agency market. I'm going to check Twitter very quickly to see if there was anything else that we missed in that regard, but doesn't look like there is for the Chargers. But uh, the Chargers did make two official moves over the weekend, uh, tendering Cameron Dicker as well as Foster Sorrell. Um, the the ERFA tag, if you will. Um, is a little less than a million dollars on the contract. So if you're looking at over the cap or spot rack, the the cap space number for the Chargers has changed a little bit. Um, but Tyler, your thoughts on, on bringing those two guys back and maybe particular Mr. Cameron Dicker? Yeah, let's start with Foster Serrell first. I think a lot of Chargers great. fans went, great, uh, no offensive tackle at five. I don't think <laughs> that's what that means, but I'm happy to have him back and hopefully he continues to develop. I don't know if he's still working with Duke Manyweather, but I believe this would be year two for him working with him. So I would assume um, so. Yeah, so great. Hopefully he continues to to develop. As for Cameron Dicker, it's a no-brainer in whatever capacity. If you said the veteran minimum or the ER, or ERFA tag or $42 million, I would have said, okay, you know, whatever. I think the guy absolutely deserves it regardless because he's, he's awesome. And the Chargers have maybe had a kicker who in – Five games has been good over one year has been good, but how about about two years now with Cameron Dicker and hitting over 90%. I mean, he's projected to be, if he continues this pace, one of the most accurate field goal kickers in NFL history. And yeah, I'm on board with that. So my reaction to that is, I don't know, like put in the Eagle noise behind me and um, get him to the Pro Bowl <laughs> next year. <laughs> yes. Everybody get ready to vote for him this year. Um, we, I wasn't super familiar with this, with this specific tagline from the NFL, um, we we had uh, Alex Katzen from Charters Wire, um, who does draft stuff for us on our own channel, um, and he you know he kind of expanded upon this that the ERFA tag locks him in for this year, and then Cameron Dicker would be a restricted free agent next year. 
So they're going to have elite kicker play on a very cost controlled contract for the next two years for the Chargers. I mean, the the kicker market's not like exploding, but like Will Lutz got like $14 million today on the market and he is significantly worse than Cameron Dicker was last year. So this is this is great news for the Chargers. Uh, we've talked a lot about Ryan Ficken and the work that he's done. You know, Cameron Dicker was not necessarily like an elite kicking prospect by any means. He he did some punting work at the Senior Bowl. A lot of people thought he could be a punter in the NFL too. Um, and Ryan Ficken and Chris Gold have really done a fantastic job of just building up Cameron Dicker's confidence. I know a lot of people after 2022 were like, we don't know if Cameron Dicker can hit from 50 plus like what kind of leg does he have like how does he handle more clutch moments in year two like was this kind of pun intended lightning on a bottle situation from a kicker standpoint and they just have continued to pour resources pour great coaching into him and now nobody has any concerns about his his leg and the distance that he can hit from and you know every single time he tried it out for for a field goal that was over 48 yards like i i felt like i could walk away because I just trusted him to make it, you know, and I didn't have to stress and, and worry and have anxiety about whether or not this kicker was going to make it. So it's just been a ton of fun to watch him play. He's got a great personality, obviously, as well. Um, he was working out with some actor recently. I forget his name. Um, he was in Top Gun, the blonde guy. My sister will kill me for not <laughs> Glenn Powell. Glenn Powell, there we go. Yeah, I was working out with Glenn Powell in Texas the other day. Like, so it's it's just it's it's a lot of fun to see his personality shine through. The Chargers obviously did a great job with the Pro Bowl media thing as well, and and hopefully that happens again next year. We need a better Call Saul sequel for next season. Um, but overall, man, like in all, in all seriousness, I'm excited about Cameron Dicker's future. The Chargers getting elite kicker play on a probably less than two million dollars over the next two seasons is uh, very very fun to see as well. So. So nice. And I think only Chargers fans get this. I don't know if there's another team that gets it like Chargers fans get it and what it means to have Cameron Dicker, obviously with the personality and everything. So great to have him on the team. But I mean, it, it used to be when the Chargers would go out to kick, I'd sit there and I wouldn't even look. My dad would have to tell me or I would just like, <laughs> like shrink into my seat. You know, I, I couldn't even watch it. Now I just go get nachos, dude. There's a there's a 65 yard field goal on the way. I'll just go get some chips, dude. Because <laughs> Cameron Dicker's going to get that. Um, it's awesome, awesome to have him returning. Can be with the team for another year and several more years. Um, I hope this is not his temporary home because it's certainly where he belongs. Yeah, hundred percent agree there. Um, yeah, Foster Sorrell, excited to have him back as well. I think you know he's he's a developmental tackle. Um, yeah, I think he showed some good good signs last season in, in limited action, but. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll kind of see what happens there. Uh, yes, it does not mean anything about the draft as much as I, I want to see Foster Shrell do well. If the Chargers want to tackle, they'll they'll still take one. Um, all right, Tyler, any other thoughts about anything that uh, happened today or this weekend for the Chargers? Nothing yet, um, but we do obviously have some. You know, there are still more positions to fill here. There are a lot more. There's a lot more work that has to get done, but so far I'm confident that they will get it done. A-plus start so far. Yeah. As it currently stands, again, these moves that we talked about today have not become official official yet. So the the Chargers, uh, like I mentioned, the Cameron Dicker and Foster Sorrell moves are official. So the Chargers currently have negative uh, $21 million in cap space. There is, at, as of recording this, there has not been any resolution on the quote unquote big four um, something has to be done before Wednesday. So by Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific, the Chargers do have to be cap compliant. So somebody is going to get moved. We'll see what happens there. Um, the other thing in terms of financially, um, Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa, who reportedly are available via trade, according to Albert Beer, Diana Rossini, and several others, um, they both have roster bonuses due on Friday. So Friday may be a potential kind of soft deadline for the Chargers if they don't want to pay those bonuses to move one of the edge rushers. Um, and then by all accounts, it's it sounds like Keenan Allen is, is here to stay, which is the right decision as well. Um, again, nothing official there, but they still have time. I know people are starting to like be a little antsy about things. I get it. Um, something will happen by Wednesday, by 1 p.m., because they have to. They have to do that in order to be cap compliant. And then we'll kind of see what happens after that. 
What, Chargers fans a bit antsy? Uh, not, not us. We would never do that. I would never. <laughs> I am also it. antsy for what it's worth. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Well, that's a you problem. Go to the gym, buddy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let it out, buddy. Um, I, the Chargers, in whatever shape, way, or form they do it, they'll become cap compliant. Uh, Joe Hortiz yeah. has said as much. He has no choice, and he's joked about that. No choice. It's going to happen. What the moves are, we don't know as of right now at 541 on Monday. I do not know, but the Chargers will figure it out. And I certainly don't think you go out and make these reported moves and bring back a yeah. Gilman without this plan already being in place. So I, I think right. that if it's two moves, if it's three, whatever, in, in some way, shape or form, I think they've been decided. And I just think we're, we're just waiting on the announcement. By the time you hear this episode, I'm sure something might come out. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you know, the, the, the chargers have to be cap compliant and then now they have these three moves to make official on Wednesday. So, um, it sounds like that's, that's probably coming down to the home stretch there. I'm sure, you know, it, things came out over the weekend that the chargers are open for business. They're taking calls on, on most of veteran players. I kind of doubt that they're taking calls on Keenan Allen personally, um, as much as people might think that, um, but if you're the Chargers, you have no reason to rush into this decision. You know, your your incentive as Joe Ortiz is to explore every possible avenue, see if you can, you know, collect some valuable draft resources for one of these guys. Um, maybe you're talking to them about taking a pay cut, restructuring, extensions, all this stuff. So if you're Joe Ortiz, why rush into making this decision as much as I and others would like to see a resolution happen? Um, if you're him, like explore every single possible avenue, turn over every stone, make sure, you know, you're, you're reaching out to all these teams. Hey, like you never know who is going to trade for what. I mean, the, the, the lions traded for a corner. Everybody kind of expected them to trade for luxurious need. And instead it's the, one of the Tampa Bay corners. So you just, you never know like what teams have strong impressions of these other players. And so um, work the phones, talk to the agents, see what kind of, avenues you have here so if you're the chargers like you continue to be patient you play this thing out you know you have to get things done before wednesday at one um but there's no real need to rush into that decision either no definitely not and they take these calls every, every team takes these calls no matter what there's only one truly untradeable player on the chargers and that's long snapper josh harris no uh, <laughs> uh, he's the only person you just never pick up the phone for i'll respect josh harris i've interviewed him he's great um, but no, every player, not that these players aren't safe, but you always, right. you always take, you, you take the call. You never know. Or you make the call, you know, if you're the other team, you make that call. Tom Telesco, Hey, Khalil Mack, is he available? Oh, Khalil Mack's available. Let's go get Khalil Mack. You know, Tyreek yeah. Hill was basically untouchable, not available. Dolphins make that call and turns out, Oh, he might actually be available and they go out and get at him. So, you know, make these calls, take these calls. It's all, it's a part of it. Um, but we'll, we'll see what happens in the next few days. No rush to get it done, though. No rush except for the part where you have to get it done by Wednesday. Yeah, except for the deadline. That, that means. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we all have deadlines in life. So sometimes you're you're able to be patient and maybe this turns into a uh, rushing situation, stressful situation on, on Tuesday night. But, you know, they, they have to get things done by Wednesday in order to sign these players to their contracts, which as an aside... The whole tampering thing is hilarious to me because like it used to just be like, oh, like they agreed to terms. Like now we have like official contract details before these players are even signing the contracts. Like we already know how much the signing bonus is, how much the year two cap it is. Like everything comes out now in the tampering period, uh, but they can't sign until Wednesday, which is is just goofy to me at this point. Yeah, I mean, by the time I can send like one tweet They've already got all these contract details and everything. Yeah. Wow. Look at that. And every structure and this and that. And not only that, but they have a subsequent move. You know, there was a move for Josh Jacobs and there's a let go of Aaron Jones. And they was like, wow, you had that all figured out within the last <laughs> two hours. Yeah. Um, it, it takes me longer to make trades in fantasy football that, or pick up players in fantasy <laughs> football than it is for, for these to supposedly happen. But yeah, uh, I'll never forget uh, the free agency two years ago where it's like, oh, the Tamari period comes open, but it's like everybody's like, oh, it's going to be a little bit. And like literally at like 
nine and like 30 seconds, Adam Schefter tweeted out that the, the Bengals had signed a guard from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers like right away. And it's like, oh, OK, so, you know, it's just it's silly to me. All these deals happen at the combine. Like, let's be real. Yeah, not for the Chargers, though. Would never happen. <laughs> All righty then. So I think that's going to do it for us today. Unless you had any other thoughts, Tyler? Nope. All right. Sounds good. Um, hopefully you guys enjoy that episode. Really excited to see what the Chargers have in store the rest of the week. Um, we'll have you covered over on our channel at the Guilty as Charged podcast. So please go tune in. Make sure like, comment, subscribe here on the Chargers channel. Uh, Chris and Matt will have you covered later on in the week to cover uh, the other moves that happen on here. So be sure to Stay tuned, stay tuned for that one. Appreciate the Chargers for having us as always. Thanks to Greg Kim for producing. And that's going to do it for us today. We'll see you guys next week. As always, bolt up. Bolt up.